So today I'm going to talk about uh, the dark matter problem. This is a problem at the frontiers of physics. It's one of the great problems that uh, by any standard is uh, extraordinarily profound in our understanding of the universe. As you'll see, uh, most of the mass in the universe is in forms that we don't know even remotely what it is for sure, but we have uh, some remarkably good ideas about what it isn't. And also, as I'll discuss in the colloquium, uh, some fascinating and promising ideas about what it could be. But let's first describe uh, its context and, and define the problem more precisely. So this, this talk will have three parts. First, I want to show that this dark matter problem we face today is not completely unprecedented, that there have been in, in through history, there have been other dark matter problems of a rather similar character that uh, have been successfully resolved and they teach us things that are useful in thinking about the present dark matter problem. They're inspiring too. Uh, then I will discuss the precise nature of today's dark matter problems, what the observations that we hope to, uh, that are so problematic that we hope to understand actually are. And then I'll, uh, I'll show where, how dark matter is not only a problem, but a solution, how uh, it helped us to construct a standard model of physical cosmology that's very successful. And without dark matter, we wouldn't be able to do that. So we begin dark matter through the ages. Uh, we'll see that two themes resound through this history of dark matter. First of all, problematic motions, and secondly, ghostly particles. Some of them large, some of them a bit small that uh, turn out to be responsible for the problematic motions. So the first thing I'd like to discuss is the discovery of Neptune. That was a dark matter problem of the 19th century. Uh, in the 17th century, uh, early 17th century, with the publication of Newton's Principia, really the beginning of physics in the modern sense, uh, we had definite, precise uh, predictions in principle for how uh, planets should move based on Newton's laws of motion and universal gravitation. And at first, the observations were relatively crude and the methods of calculation were relatively crude, but uh, 200 years of development improved both of them. So the observations become, became much more extensive and much more precise of things out in the sky. Uh, and the methods of calculation that people knew or could use uh, matured from Newton's original uh, sort of laborious geometrical methods of doing calculus to the methods we use today. Uh, and uh, through 200 years, both sides of this comparison between theory and experiment, if you like, got more and more precise and they always agreed. <laughs> this, they, 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 uh, as, uh, they got, so, so that people started to worry about very, very small possible discrepancies between the observations and the, and the calculations. Uh, this made an enormous impression, not only on scientists, but on the public and uh, the arts and artistic, sort of cultural, physical, uh, philosophical community. Uh, Newton became almost a godlike figure. And uh, this is a picture of Isaac Newton, according to William Blake. You can see he looks very fit and very able in his calculations. And this is to symbolize how precise people uh, 
the, the high standards that people expected of these calculations and this description of the world. So they were very perturbed when it turned out that uh, amid all these successes, uh, as people calculated more and more accurately and observed more and more accurately, a discrepancy appeared between the predicted position of the planet Uranus and, uh, and its actual position. This was you know, a very small discrepancy, but in, in sort of qualitative terms, less than the size of the moon on the sky, but the accuracy of the observations and of the theory was, uh, or the precision of the calculations was much more than that, and or much less than that. Like the precision was much more, <laughs> the uncertainty was much less. And, uh, and so this was a real discrepancy, couldn't be. Uh, waved away. The theory was held to a very high standard. So uh, a hypothesis arose, and this was in a way a dark matter hypothesis, that there was an additional kind of matter that was exerting gravity, according to Newton's law, that hadn't been included in the calculations. Specifically, that there was a new planet. Uh, it hadn't been that long actually uh, in astronomical terms that the, when people didn't know about Uranus either. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and now, uh, so, so there was precedent for finding new planets and uh, maybe there was another one. And Urbain Leverrier uh, took this hypothesis and made it quantitative, he uh, calculated if you had possible planets of different sizes, uh, different masses that is, and put them in different places, what effect they would have on the uh, orbit of Uranus and figured out that there was a specific mass and position where the planet could do that job, could, could, could repair the discrepancy between theory and experiment. And he sent this prediction to uh, the observers. And, uh, and one of the great, very dramatic stories in the history of science on the night of September 23rd and 24th, 1846 at the Berlin Observatory, the recipient of this prediction checked it out and found it, uh, found this, uh, object in the sky. It looks like a star, but he could go back and check the records of where the star had been seen in the past. And when he did that, he found that it was not moving with the night sky as a whole, the way stars do, but a little bit different, indicating it was a planet. And also, I think, uh, he could very soon resolve that it was not twinkling like a star, but actually had a round disk. It turns out that Neptune had been observed many times before. That's one of the reasons you could check that it had, was moving in the sky, not like a star. Uh, in, indeed, it was seen by Galileo in his original uh, telescopic observations, but Galileo uh, just thought it was another star. And here is the uh, actual data that showed the motion of, 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 of this uh, object and showed that it was a, a legitimate planet and followed Newton's laws. And furthermore, if you, uh, if you use Newton's laws and took into account the gravity of Neptune on Uranus, it fixed the problem with Uranus. So that was a happy ending to the original dark matter problem. Now, nowadays, instead of seeing Neptune as a kind of quasi star in the sky, uh, we've gotten up close and personal with Neptune and taken beautiful pictures of this uh, remarkable physical object. Yeah. Another uh, simpler in many ways, but equally important, uh, fundamentally episode of, of uh, 
dark matter discovery was that uh, there were certain stars in the sky, Sirius is one, the brightest star in the sky, and Procyon was another, that uh, when they were studied carefully, exhibited small periodic motions. And so they seemed to wiggle in the sky. Uh, now, double stars that move in the sky are very common, uh, but usually you see two stars and one of them is revolving around the other and, and it all makes sense. In this case, uh, Sirius and Procyon was, were wiggling, but there was no visible companion. So this was a dark matter problem. In this case, the hypothesis that there were invisible stars was a little bit bold, but uh, it was put forward by Frederick Bessel, or Friedrich Bessel, who's also famous for Bessel functions. Uh, it, in, uh, in any case, he, he wrote memorably that the existence of numberless visible stars proves nothing against the existence of numberless invisible ones. And this proved to be prescient. Uh, two days, Two decades later, roughly, uh, using higher quality telescopes, it proved barely possible to see that there was a little companion to uh, Sirius that you know, it was by normal standards of stars, uh, very, very dim, but nevertheless, and small, but nevertheless uh, uh, could be resolved with just looking harder, so to speak, with, with better telescopes. Uh, today, light dwarfs with better technology have become easy to study and very well understood by astrophysical standards. Uh, easier, in fact, to understand than ordinary stars because they don't have the complications of nuclear burning and shell structure and things like that. They're remarkable. Here's a picture, a modern picture of uh, Sirius A and B. This is Sirius, Sirius A, and that's the white dwarf nearby. Uh, modern tricks of telescopes allow you to essentially dim the signal from Sirius so that uh, in reality, it's much, much, much brighter. The relative brightness of Sirius A is much, much, much bigger than shown in this photograph but the tricks allow you to sort of blot out the middle of it and bring out the dwarf. Uh, and as I said, there's a beautiful fundamental theory of white dwarfs. I'll just take a moment to uh, digress to mention it. Uh, what are white dwarfs? White dwarfs are stellar remnants uh, that arise when ordinary stars of a certain size, in certain classes, uh, exhaust their nuclear fuel. So they're no longer burning and producing temperatures that cause them to have pressure that supports their weight under gravity. Uh, what happens then is that the stars get very much smaller until quantum mechanics takes over, specifically the so-called Pauli exclusion principle that tells electrons they shouldn't be in the same quantum state comes into play. And instead of being supported by uh, the pressure of hot gas, white dwarfs are supported against their own gravity by the pressure of quantum mechanical forces involving electrons. And so they are kind of giant atoms and they concentrate the mass of the sun into something the size of the earth. Basically a thousand times smaller in radius. Uh, by the way, there's a more extreme version of this uh, for stars that are slightly heavier. They collapse even more. They can't be supported by electron pressure. They turn out to contract until they are only a few kilometers in size. Uh, these are neutron stars, remarkable objects, like where as these guys are sort of giant atoms, these guys are giant atomic nuclei. Anyway, uh, another 
dark matter problem of a different nature that uh, it turns out will be very useful in understanding modern dark or modern approaches to dark matter problems uh, involving uh, particles that interact very, very weakly. This is not unprecedented. Uh, neutrinos are particles that originally arose as a figment of Wolfgang Pauli's imagination. Uh, people in the early part of the 20th century, especially in the 1920s and 30s, uh, were studying the radioactive decays of a variety of atomic nuclei, including uh, basic, the most basic process, the decays of neutrons. And they observed when a neutron decays, uh, two particles coming out, an electron and a proton. And you could add up the energies of the electron and proton that emerged and you could add up the momentum of the uh, proton and electron that emerged. Electrons are also called beta particles, by the way. And what you found was something very disturbing that the energy of the proton and the electron did not add up to the energy of the neutron. Also, the momentum of the proton and the electron did not add up to the momentum of the neutron. So uh, in order to preserve those sacred principles, just as Le Verrier had introduced a new planet in order to preserve Newton's uh, laws of gravity and classical mechanics, Pauli thought it would be a good idea to preserve the laws of conservation of energy and momentum by saying, that, oops, there's another particle that you haven't observed. This is called a neutrino or actually an anti-neutrino uh, in, in this particular interaction. Uh, and uh, the anti-neutrino was supposed to be electrically neutral because charge is conserved in this reaction. The neutron is electrically neutral and the protons and electrons have equal and opposite electric charge. So you don't need any charge on this. And in fact, in order to have escaped observation, it better not have an, any electric charge. And in fact, it better interact very, very weakly with ordinary matter. So that we hadn't, there's had to be something that hadn't been noticed all this time in the study of the nature, even though uh, they were be, being produced all the time. So it was a bold hypothesis. And uh, it took more than 30 years before experimentalists could uh, rise to the challenge of observing these guys. In the meantime, theory made a lot of progress in calculating the necessary properties of neutrinos. So it was possible to predict what it would take to observe them and what it takes is a lot of matter. So you give the neutrino many, many chances to react with things. And you have to produce many, many neutrinos. And even then only a few of them will interact. So neutrino physics has a special character of its own to show you that uh, this is a modern neutrino telescope, the so-called Super Cameo Cande uh, telescope or uh, experiment. Uh, and you see these guys here, <laughs> On a, on a boat <laughs> tending to the inside of the experiment. It's like a gigantic vat of water. So the water is the target for neutrinos. And uh, what, uh, so when the, when the thing is in operation, of course the people are gone and the whole thing is filled with water, but it needs maintenance occasionally and that's what they're doing. On the side, you see these objects that are beautifully uh, reflective. These are, shiny, uh, these are photo tubes that collect light. And what happens is when a neutrino interacts, uh, radiation gets emitted and you can reconstruct uh, what happened by collecting the light in these photo, so-called photo detectors. And 
That's how a modern neutrino telescope works. And if you point this at the sun, that is wait for the earth to be properly aligned. And uh, you, can, you can detect neutrinos coming from the sun. You can also detect neutrinos coming from other astrophysical sources by, by observing these kinds of events. It has to, it's big science and a row is, is the consequence of addressing dark matter problems ultimately uh, and thinking big. Okay, so with that historical background of uh, anomalous motions, in the one case, uh, things that didn't seem to be obeying the laws of gravity properly, the force, uh, and the other uh, things that didn't seem to be uh, obeying the laws of energy and momentum. Uh, let's look at today's uh, dark matter problem. Uh, I'll show you a number of cases in astronomy where uh, people see excess accelerations. In other words, things moving faster than they should if their motion is caused by the forces of the things you actually see. So something else has to be producing, exerting more forces and producing more acceleration, which is what's observed. The original example uh, of this arose in the late 1930s. And it's and at this time, at this time, it was kind of a voice in the wilderness. It was not taken seriously by, by the astronomical community because there are all kinds of anomalies in astrophysics all the time. And, and especially in those days, uh, most of them are not Many of them are not so significant or have routine explanations, but this one uh, turned out to grow and get more annoying and become a big problem that we have even today. So the Coma Cluster is a rich cluster of galaxies relatively nearby. I think it's a, a few uh, million light years away only that, uh, that contains thousands of galaxies in a sort of coherent clump. So it's a rich collection of galaxies that seem to be bound to each other in, in a kind of uh, um, coherent uh, entity. It's called the coma, coma cluster. Uh, and what the astronomer named Fritz Zwicky noticed in a detailed study of the coma cluster is that the galaxies within the coma cluster seemed to be moving so fast that they had more than the escape velocity. That is the gravity of the coma cluster should not be enough to keep them inside the coma cluster. So the coma cluster should, be, should have dispersed on astronomical time scales. Unless, as Wiki said, unless there's much more matter in the coma cluster than meets the eye. Let me elaborate on those two points. First of all, how do you know how fast galaxies are moving? Well, here you use the Doppler shift. When stars or galaxies are moving away from you, their spectral lines are um, moved towards the red. That's the famous red shift. If they're moving towards you, uh, their spectral lines are moved towards the blue end of the spectrum, towards uh, shorter wavelengths or higher frequencies. And uh, this, uh, this can be used, I mean, the bigger the shift, the faster the velocities, and this can be used to get uh, measures of the velocities of the galaxies far away. And, uh, and that, that's how you were able to survey what the velocities looked like and find out that they were uh, too big, uh, but that begs the question of how do you know how much matter there is? And uh, this was estimated by something called the mass to light ratios. There are relatively nearby objects, like the Milky Way of the Andromeda Galaxy, where you could measure the mass in many different ways. 
of, of the stars and, ga and gas clouds and make sure that that, that, that mass accounted for uh, all the gravity, at least in, in a certain region around the galaxy. And uh, so you got estimates of how much mass was uh, corresponding to a given amount of light. And what Zwicky found more precisely is that the mass to light ratio he needed for the coma cluster was uh, much, much larger, larger by more than a factor of 10 than, uh, than the mass to light ratios that were uh, used in other determinations more nearby. This is a, a picture of, of Squicky who was, uh, there are many stories about him. He, it, took, it took someone who thought different in order to, to uh, bring out this sort of paradox and emphasize this paradox of behavior. Uh, today, we can do uh, we can do uh, much better with modern telescopes in looking at the coma cluster, and we can see not only that the average value of mass to light for the coma cluster is uh, too big, but that there are specific galaxies in the coma cluster that have enormous mass to light ratios, much, much bigger than ordinary galaxies. These are so-called dark galaxies in, in the picture uh, that, uh, of cosmology that includes dark matter. Uh, these are galaxies that are primarily uh, composed of dark matter and they are a prediction of dark matter cosmology. And sure enough, they do seem to exist. And so, quite a few of them observable. They should actually be quite common. Galaxies in which the uh, gas, accumulated gas, uh, was not enough to light up and make stars. So the dark stuff is more, uh, higher than, uh, or the, actual, the usual galaxies actually are the funny ones. They have more, more ordinary matter compared to dark matter than, than than average, and that dark, the dark galaxies should actually be more common and have more mass. That's consistent. They're harder to see, so you don't see as many, but, but uh, they are the more or less fit the predictions. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was one piece of evidence, and, and given in kind of an odd thing, uh, the dark matter problem really became more recognized and started to be something that a lot of people worried about uh, in only in the 1950s and 60s uh, with the work of Vera Rubin, especially. So I'll show you her picture momentarily. Uh, but first, let me remind you of the fundamental basis of the physics we're going to be discussing. Uh, this is Kepler's third law of motion, which in the case of the solar system tells you that the planets that are further away from the sun uh, move slower in their orbits. Their stable orbits involved uh, are slower so that uh, they take a longer time to uh, circle the sun. And if you plot on a log log plot, uh, the uh, distance, which uh, this is this is a measure of the radius of the orbit, basically, because it's a, because the orbits are ellipses, you have to be a little bit careful about taking the semi-major axis. And this is how the square of how long uh, this is a logarithmic plot of how long it takes to go around the sun. And you see on a log log plot, you get a straight line, which means that there's a power law relationship between the two. And uh, the power law that Kepler noticed, basically by doing plots like that, uh, of course, in those days, it was much more pioneering and difficult to, uh, to do it. But he, uh, he found that 
the periods of the planets squared go like the radius of their orbits cubed. So that's, that's Kepler's third law. Okay, so, and, and that law uh, turned out to be a consequence of uh, Newton's laws of gravity and, and motion. Uh, in fact, that law was crucial to uh, Newton. He used it as a, as a, a way of getting at the uh, famous one over R squared law of gravitational forces. Okay, so now uh, what Vera Rubin found studying many, many galaxies is that if you look at the galaxies on the sky, so you look at the light in the galaxies, the stars basically, uh, you find that they occupy a finite region here roughly, and then fall off very quickly outside that region. Uh, so if all the mass were in, the, uh, were in the same place as the stars are, then once you get beyond that place where all the mass is, Newton and Kepler would tell you that the velocity should start of, of the uh, gas and uh, occasional star that you see further out that's rotating around it should fall off with the distance and follow this curve. This is the Kepler's law curve. If you just had mass where the, where the light is coming from. But in reality, what Vera Rubin found when she studied uh, red shifts associated with and blue shifts associated with 21 centimeter hydrogen line, so a, a kind of exotic form of light uh, and, or exotic form of electromagnetic radiation. See, so how this spectral line got shifted uh, due to the motion of these objects, she was able to infer that in, it was very, very far from following the Kepler-Newton curve, but in fact, the velocity leveled off or if anything, increased uh, with distance. Uh, this is a picture of what Vera Rubin looked like and, and sort of what it looked like to analyze this kind of data. Uh, this is a kind of artist's impression of the distribution. Here's the, the visible light. I should say most, almost all his astronomical pictures are uh, very much enhanced <laughs> from, from what actually appears in the telescope or now in, in, in the uh, image files of the computer. Uh, so there's a lot of artistry that goes into this, but here you see the stars, the visible part of the galaxy is surrounded by you know, other stuff meant to, dis meant to uh, indicate the distribution that that's, more, that's a lot more mass out here, even though you don't see anything. And here's a, uh, a more sedate version of the same thing, uh, that the luminous matter, sort of what you see as the galaxy, that beautiful spiral uh, is occupying a certain distance. But if you infer how much mass is needed to, uh, to account for the observed motion of objects that are moving around this center, but further away, uh, you find that you need an extended halo of dark matter, so-called dark matter, something you don't see that's exerting gravity, but you don't see it. And it's certainly not ordinary stars doesn't, or gas clouds. It's not the stuff that you normally study in astronomy. And this, this shows uh, sort of quantitatively what the mass distributions we need are. So the ordinary matter falls off, but the uh, extra matter forms a much more extended uh, disk and comes to dominate uh, right around this inner circle. <clears throat> Uh, 
Another piece of evidence comes from colliding clusters of galaxies. This is a picture of the so-called bullet cluster, which is an outstanding example of the phenomenon. Uh, the, you, you find two clusters of galaxies, roughly comparable to the coma cluster, but further away, uh, that have passed through each other in the past. That's what the picture looks like, and that's how it's interpreted. But what you see is that, uh, there's a kind of separation of what uh, that occurs when the, when the galaxies pass through each other. The stars pass more or less unscathed through because they interact relatively weakly with each other. Whereas, uh, because stars are, are uh, thinly spread through galaxies, so they, they more or less pass through, but the gas clouds that are associated with the galaxies and actually have contain more mass than the stars in general, uh, don't pass through. So they, they get held up, they get slowed down because they interact electromagnetically with each other and radiate and that makes them slow down. And so you have the distribution of gas in red here and the distribution of stars out here. But what you find is that when you measure the mass of what's out here by gravitational lensing, which is a technique I'll show you momentarily to measure mass that's uh, different from uh, looking at motions and is applicable to distant clusters of galaxies, you find that there's much more mass here that's passed through and can be accounted for by the stars or uh, of course by the gas, ordinary matter gas clouds that have been left behind. So this shows that you have some extra source of matter, that's most of the matter in the galaxy that uh, in, the, in the cluster very, that has passed, that, that interact very, very weakly with itself and with ordinary matter and that just passes through in these kinds of collisions. And that's not an isolated example. Now several others have been studied and they all follow that pattern. So I'll mention one more kind of uh, evidence for the dark matter. This is a picture taken, I think with the Hubble Space Telescope of a small part of the sky. And if you point uh, in the right direction, uh, uh, that looks through a cluster of galaxies and look at the images of things behind the cluster, you find that they can be very distorted. So here in this ring, you see what looks like might be the same object represented several times. And here again, you see what looks like might be the same object represented several times. And if you look not only at the gross appearance, but at the spectra, you can check that it, in fact, these are the same object represented several times. Uh, the interpretation of this kind of phenomena is the bending of light on a grand scale. So one of the original predictions of Einstein's general theory of relativity was the bending of light. And one of its first famous uh, confirmations was an eclipse of the sun where people saw small deflections of light uh, passing of star, uh, the light from stars that pass close by the uh, radius of the sun, the outer radius of the sun. Uh, here you see bending of light on a much bigger scale and in a much bigger way. Uh, what happens is you're looking, you're over here, looking out at galaxies that are behind a cluster of galaxies and the light from this galaxy can get to you in several different ways because it can follow these bent paths where the gravity of the stuff in here bends the light and allows it to reach you 
through several different paths. It doesn't follow the normal straight line path like it's bent and can reach you in different ways. Then uh, you can use the magnitude of the effect to get a handle on how much mass there is in the cluster. That's an independent way that from the uh, mass to light ratios, uh, but you find a consistent result. And again, that you need, and, or, and also the, uh, uh, the rotation curves, you find in all cases, you need about six times as much mass in dark matter as you see in ordinary matter in the form of stars and gas clouds and all the things that astronomers study and know how to, know how to see. So the, the dark matter, which you see, which has been seen only through its gravitational influence is about six times as much as the ordinary matter. And the fact that you get the same number from very, very different, that, that six from very different considerations uh, gives more confidence that it's a legitimate physical phenomenon. <clears throat> okay, there are other lines of evidence, but uh, I think that's enough to, to, I hope, convince you that it's a serious thing. Uh, now, let me very briefly review uh, another kind of evidence. This is uh, where the dark matter plays a, um, a positive, uh, a constructive, positive role in allowing us to uh, construct a model of the universe, the Big Bang cosmology, that uh, works quantitatively to describe still other kinds of observations. And to do full justice to this would require a lecture series in itself, but I'll show you the relevant highlights. And if there are questions, of course, I'll be happy to answer them. So the standard model of cosmology has three main ingredients. Dark matter, dark energy, and ordinary matter. So let me discuss what each of those is operationally. So dark matter, that's what we've been discussing so far. It looks like it's very slow moving particles that have very feeble non-gravitational interactions. We know they have feeble interactions with light because if they absorbed light, we would have seen the light getting absorbed in, in these clusters of galaxies. If they emitted light, we'd certainly see that light being emitted. Uh, and so forth. Uh, so they don't seem to interact very strongly with light. They don't emit cosmic rays that have been observed. And they, you know, in, in general, astronomers have come up, come up empty trying to observe effects uh, from that dark matter other than um, gravity. Also, you might ask, when you have a galaxy, uh, one of these spiral galaxies that, that Vera Rubin studied, say, uh, why is the dark matter dispersed in this big uh, halo, whereas the ordinary matter makes a nice, much smaller uh, compact uh, spiral? And uh, the answer is, or the answer that's commonly accepted, is that uh, the way the galaxy forms is by gravitational collapse of uh, of uh, small density contrast in the early universe. So they start off as small density contrast, but uh, grow as a function of time as where there's lots of matter, then that attracts other matter gravitationally and it condenses. Now, if that matter doesn't have a way of losing energy, it falls in, if you like, to the getting attracted by the other matter, but as it falls in, it speeds up, and then it just kind of falls out again. If it has no way of losing energy, it doesn't settle down very well into a compact object. Now, ordinary matter has uh, reasonably strong interactions with ordinary matter. In particular, the, uh, the gas that comprises it can uh, 
ionize and radiate light, and that's a way of losing energy. So as it loses energy, then uh, it doesn't fall out. It doesn't fall out once it's fallen in, and then it can make something compact like a, a galaxy and ultimately a star or a planet. But dark matter, if it interacts very, very weakly with itself and with ordinary matter, is not so good at losing energy. And so it stays uh, relatively far dispersed. It can still get worked on by gravitational forces, but that's much, much more subtle and uh, difficult way to settle down to equilibrium. So it clumps, but inefficiently. And uh, originally, this, these, these properties uh, were broadly consistent with neutrinos, and people thought that maybe the dark matter is neutrinos. But now, as we've learned more about neutrinos through detailed study, they don't have the right properties. Basically, their mass is too small. Although people have determined that neutrinos have non-zero mass, their mass is too small to make up the dark matter. They don't exert enough gravity. Okay, so what about dark energy? This is also known as something called the cosmological term. That was the Einstein, that's the term that Einstein used. He originally introduced this. Uh, he called it his greatest mistake, but now it's kind of been resuscitated as an important ingredient of uh, our construction of modern cosmology. What it is, is a density of space itself. Uh, when you study the general theory of relativity, you find that it's very constraining. Uh, it predicts the laws of gravity and basically gives you Newton's laws plus corrections and, and more uh, exotic effects. But there's also the possibility of adding one more property to uh, the general theory of relativity, which is a which you can't uh, easily incorporate in, in Newtonian gravity. And it's the only property that general relativity allows you to add. And that's a density of space itself. This is what's called the cosmological term. Uh, and uh, for a long time, people uh, thought that, that, this, that this possibility was not one that was used by nature, but uh, in the late 1980s, it was discovered that actually we could make good use of it and needed it. Uh, so it's now part of our recipe for making the universe. Uh, it's a density of space itself. Space itself is predicted to have very, very feeble non-gravitational interactions. So this is really dark, very dark in that sense. It only interacts gravitationally. It's utterly uniform because it's a property of space itself. So it's not clumping. It's not the dark matter I showed you before, which is different. It does. And most remarkably, and the way it was discovered, is that it exerts negative pressure. So whereas in general, gravity causes things to collapse together, uh, the cosmological term causes it to blow apart. So uh, the way it was discovered was that people studying very, very distant uh, galaxies or stars found that uh, instead of their uh, velocities being slowed down by gravity, they were actually being accelerated. Uh, so we needed a modification of gravity and the cosmological term has that, has the right properties. Mm -hmm. So the, the term that Einstein discarded uh, came back to life. Uh, it only is important quantitatively on very, very, very large scales. So uh, although it's a very, very small density by ordinary standards, and we don't notice it when we have to track the motion of space satellites or, or how things fall on Earth, uh, 
because the universe as a whole is so empty, there are vast empty spaces between the stars and between the galaxies. Uh, a term, a density that just adds up everywhere, that's everywhere can accumulate and on large enough scales start to uh, be substantial. And then finally, there's ordinary matter, which is the matter that you study in chemistry and biology and most of physics and most of astrophysics and that you make, uh, that you make at accelerators. We call all of that, we call for this purpose, ordinary matter, including neutrinos. Uh, we know a lot about this. We have something called the standard model, which seems to describe the uh, existence and behavior of ordinary matter under ordinary conditions with a very, very liberal discussion, uh, definition of what you mean by ordinary. Uh, and then uh, those are the three ingredients. So ordinary matter includes quarks, gluons, photons, electrons, and all the other exotic particles that are found in accelerators. Uh, here it's just called atoms. In any case, if you just count the mass in the universe, ordinary matter is only about 5%. Dark matter, as I mentioned, is about six times as much. Uh, here is represented as five times as much. Okay, yeah, close enough. <laughs> uh, dark. And the dark energy is most of all, it's 71%. Uh, even though sort of locally, it's very, very small, as I said, because it's everywhere, literally everywhere, it's a density of space itself, it adds up in those vast, apparently empty spaces and dominates on, uh, when you take the average over really, really large samples. So what does this model allow you to explain? Well, there are, a wealth of observations that uh, support the Big Bang model of the universe. I'll just show two of the most outstanding and important ones, which, uh, which gives direct evidence for dark matter and dark energy. One is the history of expansion of the universe. Uh, when we look at distant objects, because of the finiteness of the speed of light, we're looking at the past of the universe. And we're looking at what conditions were like when the light that we're getting now uh, was emitted. And uh, so we can use redshifts and uh, the same kind of techniques we measure, use to measure velocities uh, in other cases that I've mentioned uh, to measure the velocities of distant objects and this famously gives the expansion of the universe. And in more detail, you can trace out the history of the expansion of the universe. And because the motion is affected by the gravity of the stuff that's in the universe, uh, you can calculate how much mass you need and also how much of this strange negative pressure you need in order to fit the observed expansion of the universe. And uh, to make a long story short, that recipe I gave you fits this, uh, the observed expansion uh, very, very nicely. Now, that would be very weak by itself. It was just, if it was just uh, three numbers to fit one curve, uh, that wouldn't be necessarily so convincing, but, uh, Actually, the expansion of the universe can be measured in many, many independent ways. And more important, there's another source of information about the history of the universe that's very, very powerful, that's complementary to looking at the rate of expansion. That is, uh, according to the Big Bang theory, about 100,000 years after the Big Bang itself, uh, the matter, which was earlier very, very hot and ionized and uh, radiating and absorbing photons like crazy. So it was like 
the uh, inside of a, of a, a neon sign lit up, uh, a lit up plasma. Uh, once it, uh, after a thousand years, as it expanded and cooled, it uh, got to conditions where the electrons combined with the nuclei became electrically neutral and interacted much less strongly with light. And at that point, the universe became transparent as it is today. It's a remarkable fact that we can see very, very far away stars. It's based, it means, think about it, that the universe is transparent to light. That first happened about 100,000 years ago. And because of that, we can take a picture when we look at uh, light from the early universe uh, of what the universe looked like when that light was emitted uh, 100,000 years ago, when, when the, the matter and photons ceased to interact strongly with each other and the photons began to propagate freely through a transparent universe. Now, uh, the redshift uh, associated with, with these photons is very, very large because uh, the expansion of the universe has been going on for a long time since then. And so uh, they're moving very, very rapidly away from us. They're far away. Uh, and, uh, and so what was originally in the visible region, those photons are now in the microwave region. And if you, so if you take a picture of the microwave sky, so not ordinary light, but microwaves, the same kind of microwaves you have in a microwave oven, uh, you get a picture of what the distribution of matter in the universe looked like 100,000 years after the Big Bang. And then you can see, I should say, oh, what is this picture? What you actually see is almost a uniform haze. However, if you turn up the density contrast by 100,000, you see something like this. So the early universe, 100,000 years after the Big Bang was still very, very uniform and homogeneous. However, it contained tiny seeds of inhomogeneity. As I alluded to before, uh, those seeds grow by gravitational instability. The rich get richer, so to speak, because the, where there is more matter, there's more gravity and that attracts still more matter. And that's the way that structure emerges in the universe according to the Big Bang Theory. So that's broadly speaking the mechanism, but you need to see if it works quantitatively, whether the density contrast you see in the microwave sky, when you observe it, are of the right magnitude to grow by gravitational attraction, gravitational instability into the galaxies and other structures we see today. So this gives you information about how much mass there is of different kinds. And if you look at uh, more details about how these instabilities grow, they also, they also bounce they produce sound shock waves and bounce. And there's a lot of detailed structure that you can infer uh, by uh, having a model of what the mass was and what the density contrasts were. And then you can compare all that with what's actually observed in the present day universe. And again, to make a long story short, and this modern physical cosmology certainly could support a lecture series on its own. Uh, what you find with measuring the expansion of the universe by measuring the red shifts of different supernovas here, by studying the cosmic microwave background here, and by studying uh, what's called baryon acoustic oscillations, which is basically the reverberations the shock of the shock waves that accompanied formation of galaxy clusters. Uh, you find determinations of how much dark matter you need and how much uh, dark energy or cosmological term you need. And 
each of them puts different constraints on those, but they are all mutually consistent uh, with a fit in this region here, which is the relative densities I uh, quoted to you, of basically 75%, 24%, and, and a few percent of ordinary matter, which is an impurity. Okay, so let me close by bringing in Sherlock Holmes in uh, the story Silver Blaze. Uh, you find this quotation that, uh, is there any point to which you wish to draw my attention? And Sherlock Holmes said that that's asked by Watson and uh, Sherlock Holmes answers to the, curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. And Watson says, the dog did nothing in the nighttime. And Sherlock Holmes replies that that was the curious incident. That's sort of where we are with dark matter. We've seen uh, some very curious effects, but when we look to find the dog, there's no dog. <laughs> uh, there's no and so far dark matter has eluded all conventional astronomical probes and also some very determined efforts to uh, find candidates, candidate uh, particles with uh, properties that were suggested by certain models of fundamental interactions. Uh, those very tough searches have also come up empty. I just this is, I'm not gonna go through the details of this, but just to show that a lot, of, a lot of experiments over the years have put better and better constraints on uh, this so-called WIMP, weakly interacting massive particle scenario. And so that very determined effort has come up empty. And so next week, I'll tell you what I think is the answer to the dark matter problem, but I hope this has whetted your curiosity and taught you a bit about the universe and how it works. So thank you. <clears throat> and uh, now uh, we move to questions. So, uh, I don't know exactly how this is supposed to work. Ixi, can you? Um, Frank, you have to log in into the other Zoom link that I've given. So, okay. yeah. So, so we so have some questions in chat. Let me quickly look at those and then we'll go into the Zoom, into the room for, for students where I hope we can follow up uh, with, uh, with questions. And I, I'd also just like to meet the students who've been following and see. You. Uh, what I can what I can help you with. Uh, so let's just look. Uh, so let me quickly look at these questions and see if I can get quick answers to those. Uh, could dark matter be antimatter we just haven't observed yet? Uh, no, because antimatter still interacts too strongly to be uh, to have escaped detection. In fact, antimatter, interact very, very strongly with ordinary matter. They go fluey <laughs> when, they, when they meet each other. So definitely it can be antimatter. Um, does it change the calculation of the age of the universe if we take into account dark energy? Yes, that's built into these uh, models of the expansion of the universe. Please don't... Uh, How do we see the dark matter as ordinary humans? Okay, well, uh, we see it through its gravitational influence so far, uh, and it's a frontier of physics to design appropriate antennas that will pick up uh, signals from dark matter. We don't see it with our natural endowment of senses. We don't smell it, we don't see it, taste it, and so forth. But uh, we can use our noodles, we can predict what the properties are supposed to be if we have other ideas, if independent ideas about what the dark matter is. And then we can try to devise appropriate antennas that will check our hypotheses 
check whether the particles we're positing actually exist. So the WIMP uh, story is one example of that, where people proposed properties called WIMPs that uh, were supposed to interact in a certain way with matter, and they built big, big detectors, sort of like the swimming pool detector I showed you to try to detect these WIMPs, but no dice so far. Uh, and I'll show you uh, next week at the colloquium, I'll show you how we're working to try to detect uh, what I think is the dark matter axions. Let me remind you that uh, not all that long ago, certainly on cosmological scales, but all, certainly even on human scales, uh, people didn't know about radio waves <laughs> and radio waves were a theoretical prediction and people didn't know how to detect them. So they had equations that said there should be these things, and, uh, but no one knew how, had people that hadn't uh, built antennas, but the equations told you what you needed to do to detect the radio waves. And now, of course, a uh, hundred years later, uh, after the original prediction, it's the thriving technology. We're, we're at this here, we're, we're now at, with dark matter, we're at the stage of designing antennas and we'll see if they work. <laughs>